Somebody else other than me could read tonight. So we're going to start Acts <coughs> chapter 2, beginning in verse Yeah, 14. So we started last week, you know, we read about the incident of Pentecost and then that everybody was amazed that uh, they were speaking in their own language and they thought, some of them thought, well, maybe they're drunk. And now Peter is getting ready to preach. So chapter 2, verse 14, whoever wants to read. I'll read. How much do you want read? Um, that would be the rest of the chapter. So if you don't want to read it all, then pass it on to the next person. Okay. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lift up his voice and address them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, and I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and that of we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for, the cer for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. That's good. I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, so what time is the third hour? 9 a.m. 9 a.m., right. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out from last week, the, and yeah, that little print is going to drive me nuts. The King, this version of King James is so much different from this. It's like going to be, I'm going to stay on the same page with you guys. Um... It's weird when he gave this list, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, and they're all amazed that they hear them in their own language. Why would they be amazed about them being from Judea and understanding them? <coughs> Isn't that weird? It's they like considered Judea. them a lower class of individual, I think, yes? Yeah, but they, they still spoke the same language. 
There, there are some people that say they think that that word is not what that word's supposed to be, <laughs> that it maybe got turned into something else. But they, I just think it's weird. Like, why wouldn't they be able to understand somebody from Judea? But I thought that was strange. It's even in the textual commentary of the Greek New Testament, even says, like, even has a comment on that that they're not sure what to make of that. I thought it was interesting. Then Peter's using a rhetorical device. He actually uses a couple of rhetorical devices in this. Um, and he kind of starts up with a joke. Like, oh, these people are drunk, right? So. Amen. Hello. Uh, but then it goes right into the prophecy from Joel, which is what we're going to focus on. Okay, so in the last days it shall be God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even female uh, my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay. So... All flesh. What do you make of that? Everybody. Okay. <coughs> all people. So he's he's giving it out. So he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. So does that mean you have the Holy Spirit regardless of whether or not you believe? What is, they, what is Joel saying there? So if the Holy Spirit's poured out over all people, do all people have the Holy Spirit? Would you mind filling us in? Hmm? Where are we? Oh, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Okay. The way I kind of read that is when they say that they, they're talking about law. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you might not be a Christian person, but you know right from wrong. Mm -hmm. It's law. written That's on law. your heart. Right, that is the law. Well, that is... But the law is not the Holy Spirit. Okay. So if he's saying, and I'm, I'm big time playing devil's advocate here to make us think. So if if he pours out if he pours out his spirit on all flesh, so then that doesn't mean everybody accepts it though. Right. Right. But do we accept right. it? Is it up to us? Good Lutheran question. I mean, no, do we no, actually do we accept no. it? No, we can reject it. There you go. Okay. So it is it is available. It is poured out. It's there. It's it's everywhere. It's there. But is it efficacious to everybody? No, because some people resist. Correct. So just because it got poured on you doesn't mean it took. Stuck. Right? Right. right? Didn't stick. <clears throat> now, some people, and even the Lutheran Study Bible did it, and I'm upset about that, says that uh, it says the note for pour out my spirit. God gives his people not just things, but himself in the third person of the Godhead. The promise baptism with the spirit was poured, showing that the term baptism was not regarded strictly as immersion. That's ridiculous. That has nothing to do with that right there. Uh, and to make a note like that makes Lutherans look dumb when other people read our study Bible and go, see, that's where they get that baptism is not just by immersion. Well, no, that is not a proof text for that. That's silly to be about, that that's about baptism. First off, it's not about baptism. Baptism is not the only way the Spirit is given. Uh, and especially in this context. That's reading into it big time. That, that's eisegeting, which is something we're never supposed to do. So there's exegesis, interpreting the scriptures, and there's isogesis, which is putting your opinion into the scriptures. And that's bad. Don't do that. And that's an example of where the Lutheran Study Bible does a no-no. That's not good right there. So this anybody that reads that verse goes, oh, well, this is about you know pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Well, it gets poured on you and baptized. Oh, mm. Yeah, but this isn't talking about baptism. So saying that this is talking about, you know, why we sprinkle instead of immerse, that has nothing to do with that. No. I don't know why they did that. A little surprised, actually. Uh, but it's universal. So, so God wants all people to be saved. Not all people will be saved, but he wants all people to be saved. 
you know, there are not some people who are predestined to hell. You know, those are your double predestination people. Like, I can't even think of who is. There are some people who, who believe in double predestination, that some are predestined for heaven and some are predestined from hell, for hell. Like which is, yeah, and that's horrible because, you know, number one, do you think Judas is in hell? I don't know. I don't think we can make a call. For it's not for us to judge. It's, yeah, it's not for us to judge. Uh, to say that someone can believe and be predestined to hell, it's horrible. Could you imagine? You're like, no, they, where did they get that scripturally? I have no idea. I mean, just because God knows what's going to happen yeah. doesn't... There's a difference between God's foreknowledge and your exercise of your free will. But he does harden people's hearts, he like does. Pharaoh. He also he does. says, I can save who I want to save. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, so there's no doubt. There's no doubt that hearts can be hardened, but he does not predestine anyone. He knows the outcome. He knows the final outcome, but he doesn't put his thumb on the scale. That's the difference. You know, he does not influence the outcome. Like free will. Right, exactly free will. Yeah, we still have free will. And, of course, the only free will we have is to reject him. But, all right. Okay, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Probably got to talk about that a little more, just like we had to talk about speaking in tongues last week. So what does prophesy mean? Isn't it like you, you tell about the, the Bible, the good news, the... I mean, is it telling the word what's going to happen? Yep. Is it is it telling the future? Not necessarily. Not in this context. No, no, not necessarily. So, the you know the modern colloquial definition of a prophet is someone who tells the future, is foreseeing the future. That's not what that's not what prophecy means biblically. It means prophesying means speaking God's word. Uh, so you take God's words and you speak it or interpret it and say it to other people, evangelize, spread the gospel. All right. So the spirit will be poured on all flesh and all of your daughters shall, your daughters shall prophesy, your sons shall prophesy. What about visions? Visions and dreams. What do we make of that? There's a lot in this first verse here. Wouldn't that be the same thing though? Hmm? You know, almost like kind of telling people what heaven would be like, or, you know, or what Jesus wants for us. What did I just do? Yeah, uh, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, did anybody actually look up Joel? Which I can never find Joel. Shame on me, but I always miss it. Where to go? There it is. So that's Joel chapter two. Verse 28. Um, and also note, Peter does another rhetorical device. He is not quoting it exact. He tweaks it a little bit. And that is something that they do once in a while. As you, Paraphrase. You, you quote, which is exactly what you're doing when you're interpreting scripture. You do tweak it a little bit. So if I quote scripture to you and I don't directly quote it, I may paraphrase it myself. I, I'll make a footnote in my own sermons that this is my paraphrase of this verse. I'm not directly quoting it. And you do do that for an effect you're trying to get or a point you're trying to make without twisting the meaning. It's a, you gotta be careful when you do it. You gotta really think twice before you do it. And Peter does do that. And I don't think that's gonna come across to us reading it in our Bibles because we'd have to have a English translation of the Greek Old Testament because our Old Testament is translated from Hebrew. Peter is quoting the Greek Old Testament. So if you read, if you read anybody, when you read Jesus quoting the Psalms, and then you look it up in your Old Testament, they're not going to match because ours is translated from Hebrew. Jesus is quoting the Septuagint. Uh, that's what they used. Uh, so us, we'll be able to go, oh, yeah, yeah, Peter didn't quote it exactly because this is what it says. Well, no, our Bible's going to be different anyway because he's quoting from the Greek Old Testament. Uh, so I don't think, just making you aware, he does not quote it exactly. Uh, he did tweak it a little bit, and for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. But I don't understand why it says your young men should see visions, and the old men shall dream dreams. Yeah, it's kind of weird, right? Why two? You know, two different ages. 
There's rape. Because the young men have a future to have visions of, and the men's, the old men don't have that that future to look forward to, so they they they, they dream, dream of it. Maybe. Dream of what they missed or lost. Yeah. Or it's all think? inclusive, from young to old. Yeah, when you're old, you start thinking. <laughs> <laughs> differently, huh? Yeah, you do. You think differently. It's actually really, really close. So I'm just flipping back and forth. It's not that different. Um, I think it's a rhetorical device. So I think old men and old women will dream dreams. And young men and old women will have visions. It's basically it's saying that these things are going to happen. It's going to happen to everybody. Just like I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. So he's just making examples. Young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. It doesn't mean that old women or young men aren't going to dream dreams. It's, it's just he's making examples. Of things that will happen. Things that are going to happen. Okay. All right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Take your point for it. Yeah, I think that's a rhetorical device. It's not specific, specific, you know, specifically saying, oh, well, only young men are going to have visions. It's not like that at all. It's to be actually, and you're not going to hear me say this too often, he's being inclusive, <laughs> which I usually say something against inclusivity, that reading that into, into the word, but it actually uh, wasn't quite that. And then there's a note from, I want to say Philip Lincoln. Was that it? Yeah, uh, Tertullian wrote, uh, it was characteristic of God uh, to wait patiently for the fullness of time to whom belonged the end of time no less than the beginning. So that in the fullness of time is that phrase. You know, in the fullness of time, this will happen. So in God's good time, this will happen. Uh, and it will come to pass soon afterward. And that's a matter. From Joel itself. Uh, look at I just had it and then I don't end it. Didn't have it. That was good. Well, they in keeping in mind in my little pea brain that they are still in this atmosphere of uh, receiving the Holy Spirit, having received the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So dreaming dreams and prophesying, which they could only do if, in fact, they were filled with the Spirit. This is nothing they're doing on their own. Right. So to, in, to say that they will is not that they... I mean, they, they will, but it's just more of a, manifest, a manifestation of the Spirit in... What, 122? Or <laughs> whoever, you know, uh, in all people, I guess, to put it that way. It's it just, I was thinking, never mind. But that, that's the kind of way, it's, I have to keep in mind why they would, how they would dream dreams and why they would prophesy. They would all, they have just all been filled with the Spirit, Holy Spirit. So it would be natural, a natural thing for it to happen. Yep. Yeah, I would agree with that. Sure. And then, uh, and also the dreams, you know, God revealed things and dreams and visions. Uh, so there may be some connection there. It may be a little vague. Uh, I mean, is everybody, I it mean, is God going to give revelation to all people? No. You know, again, we're talking about the word. So when you prophesy, you're speaking the word. Maybe you will have perception. When they talk about dreams, they're talking about perceiving. So people who have dreams are going to perceive things about what they will prophesy. They're going to perceive things about uh, the scriptures, and that's going to happen to all people, and that's kind of the point of evangelizing is to make them aware. So you start thinking, and then you perceive that oh, this is this is how salvation works. Um, and the manifestation of the fact that they now that you have this spirit, this is what's going to happen. Right, right. Because you couldn't do it yesterday, but you can do it today. And it would make sense that once this happens to you, you think about it occasionally, right? You don't just take it for granted. It's actually work, living and active, right? Because the word is living and active, right? Yeah, yeah. So it goes in you, 
and the spirit is alive in you, and you actually cogitate on some of this stuff. Okay, and that happens to all people, slave and free, man and woman, young and old, everyone, equal opportunity. Well, these were the people that were supposed to be sent out to carry the word out to. Right, and all these people are going to carry it home, mm -hmm. right? So from there. And spread it from there. Right, and it's going to spread far and wide. Look at the geographic area this is talking about. It's a lot of places the gospel is going to go, which then the apostles will be busy because they're probably going to start churches in all these places. Okay. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what are these signs and wonders? What is that? Is that literal? Are we going to see blood and fire and smoke? Is this like visions from Revelation or something? Or what are they talking about? And don't forget, he's quoting the prophet Joel from way back. You know, and this is what it meant. So what are they talking about? What is Peter talking about? <coughs> because Peter is telling us this is what was meant by the words of the prophet Joel who said this. So what is this? Right? Peter says, this was what was uttered by the prophet Joel. And that word uttered, I don't know what your versions have, but the word, the verb uttered, that's a that's a prophecy word right there. You know, so this is one uttering words is not your own words. When you utter, you're saying somebody else's words. So he's uttering God's words. In particular, that verb is what they mean by that. So when you see an utterance, he is an utterance of words that are not his. So he is saying the words he has given. This is what is was. Is Joel talking about the last days? No. Because the way is it he? says, and, no. and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. Mm -hmm. So. Let me not say no so quickly like yeah. I did. So. I so, what are these things? What are these days? What days are those? Show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. When did when will that happen? When did that happen? Well, it's happening then and there, isn't it? Is it? Remember, Joel is actually foretelling. It is a in that case, it's a prophecy of the future. But what future? It's in the end of the end of the is it? No, isn't it Christ showing the wonders? There you go. I mean, he's a he's a. Maybe. He's the one, one of the ones that announces Christ. I mean, isn't he one of the Who's he? prophets? He who? Joel. Joel, yeah. He is. That is a messianic prophecy. So, the, the whole story of Jesus, where did it start? What was the big wonder with the story of Jesus? I mean, other than, you know, the angel talking to Mary. For, for the general. The star? Hmm, yeah, star was there, but there was something else the night he was born. What happened? When Jesus with the angels was showed themselves to the shepherds. Okay, so you have the great light. You have the star of Bethlehem too, but you have like the announcement to the shepherds that, hey, mm -hmm. Savior's being born over here, yonder where that star is. Yeah. You know, so you have wonder in the heaven, right? Because they saw the multitude of the heavenly hosts. That word multitude means not just a handful of angels. And remember, angels are what? Angels are not little cute cheruby things they're scary. from precious moments. They're, they're enormous and they're terrifying, which is the reason the first thing out of their mouth is always, don't be afraid because I'm super intimidating and scary to you. So don't be afraid. I've got good news for you. And now there's like a gajillion of them. That's pretty much, that's a big sign and wonder in the heavens, right? Okay. But, and then... Wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. That sounds like something out of Revelation, doesn't it? Well, the sun shall be turned to darkness. Mm. We could be when Christ was crucified. Mm. That's what no, yeah, that's good. And the moon to blood. Mm -hmm. And then the giveaway is 
before the day of the Lord comes. Now, the day of the, the day of the Lord, in quotes, that is the last day. That's his second coming. So these things are going to happen before that day, so it's not the last day. So these signs that they're talking about, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, which sounds very Old Testament plaguey, right? And then the sun being blackened and the moon turning to blood. When the sun is darkened and the moon turns to blood, it's like, it's a bad omen. To, when a sailor sees a blood moon, it's like, oh yeah, the weather's going to be awful tomorrow, that kind of thing, like red at night. Like red in the morning, sailor take warning, red at night, sailor's delight. So those kind of signs, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, moon to blood, that, that's the natural order getting turned upside down, which is exactly what Jesus did. So these aren't literal signs here, talking about blood and fire and vapor smoke. We're talking about what Jesus came and did, shook the earth, which it did. And we talk about... There was uh, an earthquake, yes. Well, there was, yeah, there was an earthquake. There was an earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jesus came and shook everything up because the Jews thought one way, and Jesus said, no, it's, you've got it upside completely down. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. If you want to lead... You know, you have to put yourself first. The meek will inherit the earth. You know, Jesus' message was, should have been clear to all, but it wasn't. It was revolutionary. You know, it was, and we call it the great reversal because it's the exact opposite of, of what you think you want. You want to be rich, give away everything you have. You know, it's that upheaval of the status quo, the, up, the, the complete <coughs> reversal of what you thought you knew. And he turned that all upside down. And that's the kind of thing that they're talking about. Because all of these things talk about are disturbances of the natural order of great upheavals. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So when you read Joel's prophecy of the Messiah, what the Messiah is going to come and do was really shake things up. And then it's like, but he kind of quietly lived and died. right? So how did he shake things up? Well, he shook things up. He shook things up with the Pharisees. Um, and he performed miracles. And, and it wasn't that quiet. You know, he was fairly famous. I mean, then, and of course, he's obviously extremely famous now, right? Right, and then it shall come to pass that everyone calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, which, which re reinforces what we said at the beginning. The Spirit is available. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he continues, men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which is reinforcing, because now he has given you the text. This is the first sermon, right? This is the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost. So what does the pastor do first? He gives you the text of his sermon, which he just did, and now he is going to interpret it. And so that's what he said. Well, this is about this. Jesus, who you know, and he did all these things, which it was given to him by God to do, which you also know, because he was here in front of you and he did these things. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This was God's plan. For God so loved the world, it hasn't been written yet, but for God so loved the world, right? John 3.16. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Okay, who are lawless men? And now what you were thinking before is, is correct in thinking. So who are the lawless men? The Romans. The Romans, because the Jews have the law. They have Torah, right? So the lawless are those who do not have the law, which would be the Romans, because the Jews can't execute anybody. So when they talk about the hand of lawless men, they're talking about giving him over to the Romans, yes. So you crucified and killed by proxy. Ah, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because... It was not possible for him to be held by it. Okay, so he's proclaiming the resurrection. For David says, and now he's going to give you a Davidic, a Davidic, Davidic, messianic prophecy. I saw the Lord always before me, so he's at my right hand, and I may not be shaken. For my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your holy one see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Okay, so now he is going to uh, expand on that. He's going to give you another text. 
this text interprets the first text, and now he's going to interpret that. So he saw the Lord always before me. David lived in what? David? And he and Peter is going to expand on that, but let's work ourselves through it. So he always saw the Lord before him. He always had hope in that promise, right? David, that's what happened in Old Testament times. It was like, well, did how did people in Old Testament times go to heaven? Well, they believed in the promise. They believed in the promise of the Messiah to come, that God would keep that promise and he would then he would uh, atone for the sins of the world, and they died in that faith, therefore they got to go to heaven, which we talked about in Hebrews too, that that's what they were talking about with all those Old Testament examples. Um, Okay, so David always believed in that promise, and it's also uh, a little bit talking about the bodily resurrection. So, of course, Jesus died, and was raised, and his body never saw corruption. Right? He didn't decay in the tomb. Because his holy one did not see corruption, and his soul was not abandoned to Hades. Uh, Hades is the Greek word for hell. That's where we get our word hell from. The Hebrew concept of Sheol, the place of the dead, um, where it says... uh, Oh, loosing the pangs of death, verse 24. What do you guys have in your versions? In ch- verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death. Having loosed the pains of death. Pains of death? Okay. Pangs. Pangs, okay. So loosing the pangs of death is a Hebraism. Literally means loosening the cords of Sheol. So Sheol, the Jewish place of the dead, or the Hebrew place of the dead, uh, which then... They adopted the Greek name for the underworld, uh, which then became the concept of hell. Um, They're all the same thing, but that word Hades comes from the Greek underworld. And then Sheol is what the Jews called the underworld, the place of the dead. Uh, It's interesting to see the development of the word hell, the place hell, and how that comes out of all these different traditions, because every every tradition has a place of the dead. It's basically the same place, uh, and bad people go and suffer in them, right? Uh, but the word hell, like we have, did not exist yet. So the, they used this Greek word, and then the Jews had Sheol, which is all over the Psalms. Um, they used to have something else when we used a different translation, and I don't know what it was. Because you never really encounter, like when we were younger, you didn't encounter the word Sheol because I think they translated it differently. But it's back. It's been back since they started using the ESV. Um, okay, so Christ didn't see corruption. And then likewise, uh, yes, our bodies may you know, crumble, but God will put them back together on the last day. And you will make me, uh, you've made me known the path of life. You'll make me full of gladness with your presence. So, Verse 29, Peter starts interpreting this. So, brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that, you know, he died and he was buried and his tomb is with us to that day. And that is also a little bit of a rhetorical device, which you're not going to get this unless you've seen some commentary about how these uh, speeches were put together. Um, That was going to be very offensive to people. (laughs) Talking about him being like dead, and you know we know where his tomb is. Uh, kind of a contrast to what you say happened to the <laughs> Lord, you know, avoiding that fate. Yeah, and so a little bit that would be uh, he knew what he was going to say was provocative. I mean, yeah, everybody knows David's dead, but you don't talk about the dead. Okay, so it was a little bit of of uh, pot stir for him to do this, and you'd have no idea that that's true unless you start. Unless you read that, that 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 was what he was doing here. So I don't why know. would he do it? Rhetorical device. It's, again, it's keeping people's attention and it's kind of grabbing them. And it's like he, he already told them they killed the Savior. And so he's going to jab them again. Um, he's poking at them a little bit. He's kind of he's stirring it. He's stirring the pot. He's getting them thinking. Uh, and it's going to have great effect, as we will see in a little bit. But he said, hey, you know. I can tell you assuredly that he was both died and buried, and we know where that is. And but 
being a prophet, meaning he had the words of God, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, which he did, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. So he said, okay, so David has this promise. He has these words of God, and now he is giving utterance. That word utterance. He is giving utterance to those words of God and making this prophecy, this prophecy of the Messiah. I saw the Lord always before me. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. Christ, again, is a title, not Jesus' last name. So Christ, the anointed one. Uh, there's the Greek version of the word Hebrew word Messiah. They're the same word. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that, we are all witnesses. So he has identified the patriarch David, who everybody, we are children of David, right? We're children of David, just like we're children of Abraham. He was our great king. David believed in this promise. He had faith in this promise. And he died in that faith. And not only did he die in that faith, but he spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he would be raised from the dead. This thing here, what David said is, he is now speaking as if Jesus is the one speaking, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You'll make me full of gladness with your presence. So not only did our patriarch David die in faith, but he also predicted, he prophesied that the Christ would die and be raised from the dead. And by the way, that's Jesus. And by the way, we're all witnesses to that. We were here. We saw it. He was raised from the dead. So now he's giving that gospel message. And being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, verse 33, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And so not only that, but Jesus now exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father all things, and has promised the Holy Spirit, which he has now poured out on us. And that's what you're getting here, live, in person. All right. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so let all the house of Israel, that's all you people listening right now that think all these guys are drunk, let you know for certain that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So is that law or gospel? It's a heck of a sermon. I mean, what do you make of that? I mean, that's all gospel. You know, this, the promise that the Messiah would come. He hasn't proclaimed the forgiveness of sins yet, right? It's all law. It's all been law. Until you know Peter was Lutheran. It's law, 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 law. Gospel at the end. Is what we Sprinkle of sugar at the end, right? I don't think God too. Okay. So this has all been law so far. This whole sermon, nothing but the law. It's nothing but convicting the conscience. And it worked. So now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off everyone whom our Lord, our God, calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Okay, so he said other stuff too. We don't know what they are. And maybe it doesn't matter. And that's why it's not recorded. So it's been all law, 100%. And it worked. They were cut to the heart. All right, so the heart, the seat of emotion. I mean, that means the same thing today as it meant back then. So they're cut to the heart. Wow, what do we do? Well, repent. Repent of your sins and be baptized. Be forgiveness. Be forgiven. What does baptism do for you? The forgiveness of your sins. Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, do we just baptize in the name of Jesus Christ? Or are we baptize in the name of the triune God? What does that mean? And there are people who say, I only baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. There are denominations that do that. Which, so, 
But all three are one and the same. Mm -hmm. So be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And the being baptized in the name of doesn't mean I'm baptizing you in the name of Jesus Christ. It's like in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm baptizing you. It's kind of, right? A little bit of a turn of phrase. But it doesn't mean... Not ruling out the Trinity. It's not ruling out the Trinity. What it's really doing is, okay, well, there's John's baptism, John the Baptist's baptism, mm -hmm. right? Oh, it's differentiated. Now, is John the Baptist's baptism good? Is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's valid. I don't know if he baptized Christ. Anybody can baptize. But is that a Christian baptism, what John did? No, it's not. No, it is not. So if you receive John's baptism, are you baptized? No, that's not Christian baptism. It wasn't instituted until Christ instituted it. Now, it did do something. They were being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. So it did. Did it give the Holy Spirit? No, nope, we're not told that. Now, the Holy Spirit came and descended on Jesus, but that's the only person that we know of. Um, so that baptism of John, no, it is not the same as the baptism we were baptized with. It forgave sins, but it didn't give the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it was different, and that's the point. Yeah, they're making a differentiation here. So John's Sorry, baptism... Are you saying when we baptize now, we don't get the Holy Spirit? No, I didn't say that at all. I said John's yeah. baptism didn't give the Holy Spirit. Okay. That we know of. We're not told that. Yeah. Why in... This has always bothered me for all the years I instilled with grace with the Lutherans. During baptism, and in the little purple thing, mm -hmm. it says baptism saves you. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a, the way it's printed in that, it always bothered me because it's sitting there by itself. Mm -hmm. And if an unbeliever or a non-believer or a new believer came and heard that, came to a baptism, they said, oh, I just had to get baptized and I'm saved. And that's not true. Baptism now saves you. Yes, it does. Infants, especially infants. Yeah. That's why we have, that's why we, and this is for you and for your children, that's why we <clears throat> baptize babies. How else would they be saved? Scripture says because because, because, no, I, I can be because, saved. because yeah. baptized gives faith. It gives right. faith. Okay. So you don't have to have faith to get baptized. Right. Right. And it's something God does to us. Okay. So what about people who then receive Christ on their you know come to Christ on their deathbed, profess Christ as their Savior mm -hmm. and they don't get baptized? They're still okay. saved. The thief on I'm the sorry. cross. Bapti well, wait. Baptism now I, saves I, I, you. That's exactly. Okay. Okay. Baptism now saves you, and he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he who does not believe shall be damned. It does not say, and he who does not believe and is not baptized shall be damned. You don't have to be baptized to be saved, but it's an awfully good idea. That, okay, now, you just said, and, and, you don't have to, and a strict, to be saved, but then we'd say, no. baptism saves you. No, baptism now saves you. <laughs> the, being baptized saves you, but you don't have to be baptized to be saved. That's not oh, saying okay, the same okay, thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, a strict reading of our Lutheran confession says you have to be baptized, and that's something for academics to debate exactly the way the words are written, if that's what it actually says. That's at God's discretion. Yeah, that's at God's discretion. Um, we know that baptism saves you, period. And we also know that's not the only way to be saved. You believe, which is by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's something God does to you anyway. So yeah, baptism saves you, but it's not the only way to salvation. No talk. Okay, we can. <laughs> no, her, her thing about the thief and the cross. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, today you'll be exactly. with me in paradise. We don't know if he was baptized. We yeah, we don't know if he was baptized. That he wasn't. Exactly. Yeah. Because he. You know, so you don't have to be baptized yeah. to be saved. That's why. I'm but baptism <laughs> saves you. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so I sure, you sure baptize sure a baby, you baptize a baby, that baby's saved. But you're on your deathbed, and you just heard about Jesus, and you say, "Yes, I believe," and take your last breath, and you're not baptized, so you're still saved. Okay. We'll talk. Okay. okay. <laughs> what happens if you're baptized as a baby, but you don't live like a Christian? Well, you can fall away. Yeah, you that's can, free you, will. You, you can fall away. That's the only. That's the only, actually only freedom of the will we mm -hmm. have is to reject God. So you're rejecting your salvation. Now the that's question right. is: Okay, you live like a heathen. You get baptized as a baby, and you go to Sunday school for a few years, and then you fall away, and you're gone from the church for thirty years, and then you come back one day. Do you have to get baptized again? 
No. No. Did you actually lose the Holy Spirit? Because what made you come back? It wasn't your choice. <laughs> he chose you. So was that baptism still efficacious? Yeah. Well, now, would you have gone to hell during that time if you died? That's not for me to say. Uh, when you said, did you lose the Holy Spirit? Uh -huh. How do you do that? Reject him. Say, I don't want you. Oh, I can. Oh, okay. Yeah, You're yeah, rejecting yeah. Christ. I, I, okay, I got that. Yeah, there's no, there's not much you can do to lose the Holy Spirit other than well, saying, I don't want the you. Holy Spirit. The, the, only unforgivable sin, the only unforgivable sin is, God, I don't want you. I know you're there, and I don't want you. Mm -hmm. okay. I want nothing to do with you. Then, yeah, you have a problem. Yeah. Uh, but if there, is there something you can do one day? I just went, oh, well, I went and did it now. I lost the Holy Spirit. No. Other than saying, I don't want you. Go away. That is the only <laughs> unforgivable sin, which brings up the whole suicide question. Well, then, you can't say with authority anything about that. That's only for God to know. Okay, so repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. So then in the name of Jesus Christ means baptize the way Jesus told you to baptize. And how did he tell us to baptize? In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So the difference between now, what's the deal with baptizing, with John and baptizing? That was a thing. Okay, so baptism in, in the Jewish culture, that was a thing. Baptisms happened, not for the reason Jesus instance, excuse me, cough drops. Oh, the menthol makes me burp sometimes, excuse me. So the baptizing that took place, like Old Testament type of baptism, we're actually going to talk about that in the Advent series this year. Uh, you know, your Old Testament baptism, you know, this, this ritual washing, which we talked about in Hebrews at length about all the different things you had to do to purify yourself as a priest before you could go offer your own sin offering so that you could make sure you purified the people so that you could offer their sin offering before you could even talk to God about anything, right? And then Jesus gives you this baptism that just gives you, boom, you're a child of God, you're a priest. You can talk to me directly. No intercessors, anything. So, so that John's baptism was you know, preparing the people, purifying them ritually to me because before... Went back up, rewind, just had a great thought, a way to explain this. So, John's baptism was a baptism of preparation, correct? Because what was John doing? He was preparing the, the way. way. For the Lord. Okay, so he's preparing these people to meet the Messiah. All right, so what are they doing? They're becoming ritually pure because before you could go to the temple and make your offering, you had to be ritually clean. Mm -hmm. And that's what that baptism did. It made you ritually clean to meet the Messiah. And now you're baptized in the name of that Messiah who said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that's a different baptism entirely because now that means that you can go directly to God. You don't have to go through this ritual purification. You are actually purified. You're actually 100% righteous and clean. Once for all time. Exactly, right? That was the once for all time sacrifice for some. There's no more sin offerings. There are no more ritual purification. A Hebrew study was helpful to bring that stuff to our to our mind um, so you could actually if you want to read in the book of Hebrews uh, chapters I don't know what but when you get to like 10 11 12 uh, it, it kind of summarizes all that stuff it's good stuff okay so that's what that ritual purification was all about and then Jesus comes along now it's a different point which we've seen Jesus do that before with the Lord's Supper Okay, so they're having a Passover meal, and there's umpteen cups of wine in that ceremony. And there's one cup called the cup of blessing. And that's the cup that instituted the Lord's Supper, and Jesus turned it into something completely else. So it's no longer the cup of blessing, but Paul calls it the cup of blessing that we bless. Do we, is it not the blood of Christ? So it is, that is actually what that cup is called in that meal. So it's the cup of blessing is now the Lord's Supper, and then he did away with all the other stuff. You don't have to do it. Uh, so, so Jesus takes things and, and repurposes them, I guess you could say, to greater purpose. So baptism, this old, they used to, word, the, the, even the word baptize, the Greek word baptizo, which if you look in the Old Testament and the Septuagint and they talk about ritual washing, it is the word baptizo. It is, so I'm baptizing a dining couch 
or I'm baptizing these utensils. It just means wash. That's all that word means. It means something different to us because we have borrowed it from Greek into English to mean when I baptize somebody, it's this thing that God does to us through water and his word. But just the Greek word baptize just means to wash. So the Jews baptized everything, dining couches, utensils, Clothes, you have it. You you name it. That's why you remember the wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle? Okay, they had the stone jars mm -hmm. that held water for the ritual washing, the Jewish washing rituals. And this was at a house. And they hold like 60 gallons each. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of baptizing going on. So just think about how many things they must have ritually washed with that water. Okay? So that was the thing. And that's that turned into, well, John's baptism which was also a ritual washing, but it's different because obviously this guy's a prophet. Something special must be happening. He's preparing us to meet. He's saying the Messiah is coming. And then there's the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which they obviously must have forgotten about. <laughs> right? Okay, what was that? And now, hmm. and now baptism is something completely different, which is how you become his child because Jesus declared it to us. You know, go and do this. So when you say baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it's not some new baptismal formula other than one he instituted. So it's Jesus Christ's baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit instead of John's repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Different, different people, different thing. So that, that's the only difference. That's why they said it that way. Um, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone who the Lord our God calls to himself. See the who's doing the verb right there? God's doing the work. This is for you. God does the work, not we. No age of accountability. No, I have to make a decision for God. Now I have to make a decision for Christ. I have to sit in the hot seat. I have to do an altar call. I have to make up my mind to do this. And then as a testament to my faith, I will allow myself to be baptized. No, God calls you and he baptizes you. He does it to you. And he says, go do this to everyone. This is for you and for your children and for everybody. Do this to them because I do the work and it's for you. It's great. And it's for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So right there in that passage is why we baptize babies. And that is why we believe it's true because God does the work. We don't baptize. You don't decide to get baptized. God baptizes you. He does the driving of the verbs. That's a great, great text for that. And for everybody. And then it goes on right from there. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort. All right. So Peter said other things, but save yourselves from this crooked generation. Boy, that's what Jesus preached too, right? He said, you know, friendship with the world is making you an enemy of God. And that meant the same thing 2,000 years ago as it does to us. Some things never change. It's like the, it's like the book of Revelation. Well, you know, you see all these visions and things. It's like, oh, here's the, here's the famine and here's the pestilence and here's the, the disease and here's war and tyranny. That's what's coming in the last days. Oh, you mean like right now? Could, do we have those things in the world today? Yeah. Did they have them 2,000 years ago? Yeah. Do they keep repeating? Yeah. We're in the last days. It's a, the last days have been going on for a while until he comes back. Okay, so yeah, it's not a warning of things to come. It's a warning of, hey, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Don't be, you're in this world, but don't be of it. Don't put all your faith in it. Put your faith in Christ, not in, you know, the glowing magic boxes we carry in our pockets. And so all those who received that word, he they were baptized. So they got the law. The law did its job, right? This is actually a great test, text for uh, catechism, which is why we're doing we're, we're doing the New Testament for catechism in my cate in my confirmation class this year. And this began it began with Acts chapter one. It's like why instead of doing the catechism, we're doing the New Testament. So it's like, why are they starting with that? Ah, that's why they're starting. Because look at all the cate all the stuff in the catechism that's in this chapter right here with the day of Pentecost. Okay, so the law did its job. It made their spirits receptive to the gospel because if you don't think you're a sinner, telling you that Jesus died for you doesn't do you any good. 
because unless you, well, great, he died for me, so what? Well, you're a sinner, and without Jesus dying for those sins, you're going to hell for eternity. If you don't know you're a sinner, the gospel does you no good, right? The Pharisees didn't know they were sinners. They should have. I think deep down they did, but the Pharisees didn't know they were sinners, right? So, oh, how can you eat with these guys and blah, 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 blah? And he called them hypocrites. Why did Jesus call the Pharisees hypocrites? Because they didn't see their own sin, right? Thank God, I think I'm quoting, I love quoting that. That's in my sermon this Sunday too. It's like, thank God I'm not like that guy, guy on the street corner. Thank God I'm not like that guy over there, a sinner. Mm. Smell me. Which is why for some reason I'm, I'm praying in front of everybody on a street corner because that's not, what, who does that? Really? They did that? All right, so. Bible thumpers. Bible thumpers. Like first century Bible thumpers. Torah thumpers. Bump and scroll. Scroll thumpers. So the law did its job, tenderized some hearts. They were receptive to the gospel. And like 3,000 3, conversions on one day. And the Christian church has never grown like that since. Right? Whatever. So that's pretty good. 3,000 converts in one day, right? Since they served that 120 together. Yeah. Well, it was 120 guys. Now they got 3,000. How many people were there for the festival? Oh. All right, so on a good day, you know, the, the population of Jerusalem is like 30,000, 40,000 maybe, and that's on the high end, I think. Uh, so you figure with a th- big festival like that, let's call it a quarter million, which might even be high, so 200,000 even. 3,000 out of 200,000, meh, meh. All right, still, it's not bad, but it's not about the numbers. Right? It has nothing to do with the numbers. The fact is these 3,000 people from all over the world then went from there and took that gospel back with them. Now that's a mega church. That, yeah, that is. That's pretty good. It's still not the biggest church ever. So that one in Texas, I think, is like 9,000 on a Sunday, which is ridiculous. How do, how do the pastors even know the people? They don't. I mean, it's crazy. But I'm not, I'm not bashing mega churches tonight. Because deep down inside, we're all jealous. Could you imagine having a church that big? All right, so, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So who's they? And they devoted themselves. Who do we think they are? All the people that were the church. Well, the people that were visiting, they went home. Okay, so they didn't just they didn't just camp out. That was the last day, the day of Pentecost. That was the last day of the festival. So they're going. They're hearing. They believed, and they went home. So this is the early church. That's like there are 120, right? And and I'm sure there's people from Jerusalem that got converted and stayed, right? So they, the core group, Jesus disciples and these new converts that lived in or around Jerusalem, they stayed. And maybe some people didn't go home. I don't know. You know, I'm conjecturing, but it's the last day of the festival. These people went home, and that's why Jesus told them to do this. Okay, so Jesus said, you wait, and then the Holy Spirit will come upon you not many days from now, which was like 10 days ago, because it was 40 days after Easter that he ascended. And then Pentecost is the 50th day after the, 50th-ish day after the Passover. So that's how long the Festival of Weeks or the Festival of Booths or the Festival of Pentecost, whatever you want to call it, has many names. So they're all there, and now they're all going home. Last day of the festival. And you always remember who was the last act at one of those big shows, right? They put the headliner on last because that's the one everybody came to see. So it makes them wait to the end. So everybody's there, and then boom, this happens. And that's the thing everybody's going to be talking about on the way home. Did you see what I saw? That was amazing. So this happened, the church began, these people stayed. These are, they're staying and they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, breaking of the bread and the prayers. So the breaking of the bread is? Communion. 
Lord's Supper, right? So it's not just eating. Breaking the bread is also a euphemism for the Lord's Supper and the prayers. So they're doing church together, fellowship, Lord's Supper, praying. Boom, you got a church. And awe came upon every came upon every soul. So the word awe is also the word fear. So fear, what are we afraid of? Well, when we're supposed to have the fear of the Lord, it's supposed to be the awe of the leg. Yeah, wow. Awe. Awesome. That word awesome that we have, that us 80s kids, we ruined it for everybody because awesome doesn't mean anything anymore. Because something that is awesome, you can't express it. It's, yeah. it's right? So, oh yeah, that's awesome. You're, you're awesome. They're not awesome. God's awesome. So we ruined it. I'm sorry. Generation X, we ruined that word for you guys. Awe came upon every soul. That's impressive. And many wonders and signs. There's signs and wonders again. So the apostles are doing signs and wonders. And who else did signs and wonders? Sunday school answer. Who did, who did signs and wonders? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, so the apostles can do the signs and wonders. Why? Because the because Holy Spirit came might. upon them. No, no, no. Well, yes. Yes, the Holy Spirit came upon them. But why, why would they have to do signs and wonders? So Jesus did signs and wonders because people should have just believed what he said when he says, I'm the Messiah. But because people are dunce, he goes, okay, so I'm doing all these things. I'm proclaiming to you repentance for the forgiveness of sins, that I will die and rise again for you. But since you won't believe that and you are stubborn, I will do miracles. I will raise people from the dead. I will heal the sick. I will cast out demons. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, right? And also I'm going to proclaim forgiveness of sins because you have to see it to believe it. And now the apostles are talking about Jesus in heaven. So now the apostles are preaching the gospel and they have to be able also to do these things. Now a time will come where they no longer have to do that. And that's why after the apostles' generation, do you hear of people being able to heal people with their shadow? No. no. Peter can do it. Nobody else can do that, that we know of. So they could raise the dead. They could heal the sick. They could cast out demons. They did signs and wonders just like Jesus did. <coughs> The other disciples can't do that. The apostles can because they were the key eyewitnesses. They were there. They saw it. And they can, how do they know we can say what they say they saw? How can we take their word? Because we can see them doing the same things Jesus did. So that's why they had to be able to do those things. And a time will come where that's no longer necessary. Now it will just be the word of God is being written and circulated and distributed. Okay, so that's why the wonders and signs. Okay, so all who believe, they're together. They had all things in common. Communal living, not communism. Communal living. They were together. They had all things in common. They pitched all their stuff together and shared. Did they, what are, and, their wives and children, did they have wives? Did any of them? Well, we know Peter was married. I don't know how we know that. But I've always been, I've always been taught. That. Yeah, mother, that's right. That's how we know that. I just knew it was something simple. So we know Peter was married. Um, we don't hear if they've had children. Yeah, we don't know. No, no. I mean, you have to assume that was normal for the time you have, you got married and you had children. That was important to that culture. Nobody ever decided to not have children if they could. That that's just not what they did in that culture. Uh, that. The Psalms have that in there, so that was that was a big deal. Family was important, so I, yeah, I don't think anybody became you know monkish like oh well, I'm a I'm a uh, that would have just been abnormal. It's like well I'm an apostle of Jesus and I'm going out and proclaiming the gospel, so I'm not going to have family, so I can dedicate myself to this. I mean even the Levites. Well, Jesus right? called them as adults. Yeah, they were not in their teens; they were adults right. working. Except for John, I think he was a teenager, but yeah. So they, they probably had families. Yeah, so, so absolutely. So, I mean, did they all live together? I don't know. They were together. They believed and were together, but it doesn't say they like lived in the same house or anything like that. Right. Uh, but they, 
if anybody had wanted for anything they shared, yeah. Uh, which we could probably, we do okay with that. I think okay with that today in a lot of churches. I mean, if somebody has a real need that we get together and we take care of them. Um, but I think what we're seeing here is like they really took it to heart. Now, maybe was it easier in those days? I don't know. I'm hypothesizing because that's something that would be foreign to our culture because we work hard for what we have and then we like to keep what we have. I mean, it's one thing to give a church, but it's just like, oh, well, hey, you know, I have two loaves of bread. You need a loaf of bread. You know, it's a little more down to earth day to day that we're talking about here. Um, that's actually what they did with yeah, breaking bread in the homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Like the, Usually when you brought the food to the table for the communal meal, that included the bread and wine for the sacrament, by the way. So it's not like, oh, somebody's got to go to Mozax and get you know, the sacramental wine and the wafers. It's whatever was on the table, that's what you used. Uh, and there would always be bread and wine. I had a point to this rant, uh, but I kind of lost steam with it somewhere along the way. But I think I was saying that... Uh, you were saying how we still help others in the church. We, we do, but... Could we do better? I think as a church, and maybe this is a Lutheran thing too, but I don't know, that like usually our help for others, and it's different because we like have a food bank here at this church, and we do, when, and we have like a fund when someone needs help in the congregation, um, that kind of thing, but... You don't really have, like we as Lutherans, like, oh yeah, we, we help our neighbor in need by sending a check who they didn't send to whatever foreign country needs it or whichever disaster relief they're taking care of today or what have you. It's we love to have missions to send money to and that's how we share, not necessarily with the guy sitting next to you in the pew, which we do. I mean, but we've not had a tragedy. We've not had a tornado that has... Right, right. That affects Down us, homes. right? Or we've not had a big flood, rainstorm that has washed out many right, homes. Right. We've not had a forest fire. Yeah, thank God. I mean, we've not had those things where other communities in our nation have, and we've heard that their that their churches get together. And I mean, just on the news tonight, I heard that a church someplace uh, where Ida, down in Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, was they the people were giving out food 24 hours a day for the people who were affected. Nice. Now, we would do something similar if we Oh, had certainly. And I'm, and I'm, but I'm not talking about natural disasters. I'm saying just as a, uh, for the most part, it's like we have, and I'm not accusing either, so don't take what I'm saying wrong. I'm actually probably just babbling at this point. But you know, when you think of, like, when we typically think of, of helping people in need, we think of sending money to disaster relief. Because like you said, thank God, nothing's ever happened here like that. But is there... But you don't know how many people in our con congregation take food to a friend who... That's also true, too. Uh, or yeah. uh, driving older people to the doctor. There's a lot of that going on in our congregation. Sure. I actually it's do know just about not that proclaimed. Right, yeah, and that's people all good, too. do it quietly. They it's just do it. Let your right hand not know what your what left hand's doing. tells them to do. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not accusing. No, you're not. But no, I'm you're not just trying that. to illustrate what's going on then and how they lived together and helped each other. And do I don't that. think there were any, you know, like would be any behind the scenes for that. I think everything was way out in the open, which is probably un very uncomfortable for us. And that is one of the themes in the book of Acts. That's where I was going with it, was the idea of, of community and communal and not, you know, not like hippie commune. That's, that's our pop culture baggage getting dragged into it. But that kind of, you know, we're individuals at all costs. That's the American way. And I mean, we're not maybe that black and white about it, but that's the American way. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you achieve what you achieve. He who dies with most toys wins. That would be completely foreign to these people in the first century. They do not understand, they would not understand what that means. You know, it's not that you know, it's like if you have a patch of vegetables, that's for whoever needs vegetables. You know, it's not my garden, it's our garden. And it would be just completely foreign to them, the way we think. Uh, that's why they didn't glean the fields. Yeah, they don't glean the, the fields poor, in case, a, in case a soldier came by. Yeah, right. or, or yep. the poor 
people that yep. needed it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so that would be like, could you imagine doing that? It's like, oh yeah, don't pick all your vegetables because someone might come by and need some of that, so leave a little bit. What? What are you talking about? Yeah, so it's a just completely different, uh, different. Thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, we could probably look into that a little bit more next week because it's one of those things in the intro that we talked about that a lot of people weren't here for. Uh, so we'll maybe the beginning next week we'll review a couple of those ideas of things that are typical for this period that when these people live that are going to be completely foreign to our way of thinking. So it might just, you read it and you don't think anything of it. Like these few verses talking about the communal sharing, that's like next level stuff beyond what we think of uh, because that's just the way they thought and didn't think anything of it. So that's where we'll end. And then next week we'll start with chapter three after a brief review of a couple of things. And we'll start seeing about the apostles doing some of these wonders and signs. And then Peter's going to preach again. All right, so that's where we will end tonight.